Okay, um, worthy Grand Knight, worthy Deputy Grand Knight. Um, tonight I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, the Queenship of Mary. Um, liturgically, this probably would fit uh, better in May, but I, I've had a couple recent opportunities to speak about Mary. In fact, I'm going to be speaking about Mary again tomorrow evening. So I've been doing my research, everything's fresh, I'm kind of excited about the topic. Um, the, uh, the Jewish people enjoyed a kind of golden age under King David and his son, King Solomon. And thereafter, things went steadily downhill. Eventually, they were conquered by the Babylonians. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them were uh, let off into exile. The, uh, the Babylonians were subsequently uh, conquered by the Persians, and the Persian king Cyrus the Great allowed the Jewish people to return to their homeland. But uh, Judah continued as a province of the Persian Empire. And then they later lived under Greek rule, and then they later lived under a brutal Roman occupation. And so the, the Jewish people pined for the restoration of the kingdom of David. And they believed that when the Messiah came, he would restore the Davidic kingdom. Something to know about the uh, ancient kingdoms of the Near East. So in the... Uh, ancient kingdoms of the Near East, the kings tended to have a lot of wives, which created a problem. Actually, probably created a lot of problems. But it created a particular problem when it came to which woman would serve as the queen. The way they solved this problem was that none of them did. The queen was not any of the wives of the king. The queen was the mother of the king. Um, and in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, we read about uh, Adonijah, who was a half-brother of King Solomon, approaching Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, to ask her to ask King Solomon for permission to marry Abishai the Shunammite, uh, who had been a, a servant, to a girl who had taken care of King David in his old age and was now a servant at Solomon's court. There's a little bit of political intrigue going on in this passage. Uh, but it's important because it tells us that the kingdom of David followed this pattern. That Sheba, the mother of Solomon, was Solomon's queen. Um, you see, when the king held court, when he conducted the affairs of, of, of state, when he met with his ministers, when he passed laws and, and, and levied taxes and uh, approved public works, did all the things that governments do, his mother, the queen, would sit at his right hand at the place of highest honor. And her role in the court was to be the representative, the advocate for ordinary people. She was there to represent their interests, to make sure that his policy was made, the interests of ordinary people were taken into account. If you were a fisherman, a farmer, a shepherd, and you had some matter that you wanted to bring before the government, you were very unlikely to get an audience with the king. But you had a right to speak to his mother. <clears throat> we need the Old Testament for background and context. But we also need it because it gives us earthly models and examples that we can look to to help us understand the heavenly realities that are discussed in the New Testament, as well as, as, well as we're able. When we get to Luke's gospel, we're told explicitly that the kingdom of heaven is the restored Davidic kingdom and that Jesus is the king in the kingdom of heaven. Well, if the kingdom of heaven is the restored Davidic kingdom, and Jesus is the king in the kingdom of heaven, then logically his mother, Mary, would be queen in the kingdom of heaven. And logically she would play a role in the kingdom of heaven that is analogous to the role that the queen mothers played in the ancient Davidic kingdom. Otherwise it doesn't mean anything to say that there's the kingdom of heaven is the restored Davidic kingdom. You could say the Tang Dynasty was the restored Davidic kingdom, or the Iroquois Confederacy was the restored Davidic kingdom. This logically follows. 
<clears throat> when we get to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, we read about the woman clothed with the sun. And the woman clothed with the sun gives birth uh, to a, a male child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. That is an allusion, a reference back to one of the messianic test, uh, prophecies that we find in the Old Testament. It's a, a reference to Psalm 2. So if the woman gives birth to the Messiah, and Jesus is the Messiah, then the woman in Revelation is giving birth to Jesus. And if the woman in Revelation is giving birth to Jesus, then she must be Mary. We can get there by a couple of different lines of argument, but for present purposes, I think that establishes her identity. And she is a royal figure. Right? She's crowned with 12 stars. A royal figure enthroned in heaven. So in this passage, we find confirmation of this idea that Mary is the queen of heaven. I think we struggle with the idea of Mary as queen of heaven because we don't live in a monarchy. In fact, we're very, very far removed from the, the uh, ancient kingdoms of the Near East. Um, Jesus could have entered into our history at any point. He chose to enter into our history at a point in time when monarchy was the rule, when there were uh, protocols and etiquette that were observed and known by everybody that are just not part of our uh, world today. And I think to understand her, her role properly, we have to, to, to look back to that example that we've been given in the Old Testament of the Davidic kingdom and understand how it worked. I'm often asked when I speak, you know, why, why should we ask Mary to intercede for us if we can pray uh, directly to Jesus? And I think uh, there are at least four reasons. The, the first reason is that any time we ask someone more worthy than ourselves to, to intercede for us, to pray for us, to take some action on our behalf, we demonstrate humility. The second reason is that when we ask Mary to intercede for us, we are following the courtly protocols of the ancient Davidic kingdom, which is the model that we've been given as the uh, earthly example to help us understand as much as we can about how things work in the kingdom of heaven. Third, uh, because in the kingdom of heaven, each person has a role to play. When we ask Mary to intercede for us, we're acknowledging that God has tasked her with hearing our pleas and petitions. That is a role that she has been assigned in the kingdom of heaven. So to ask her to intercede for that is to recognize that and to acknowledge that. And then finally, heaven is a family. By virtue of our baptism, we share a, a deep spiritual connection with Mary and with all the saints. When we ask Mary and other saints as well to intercede on our behalf, we are acknowledging that we understand that we are part of this communion, that we are in communion with these people. They're not dead and gone. They're very much alive in Christ. And they, they, they have the, that we share this, this deep and profound spiritual connection to them. So I thought uh, I would just share some of those, those thoughts with you. It's, again, kind of out of, uh, out of sync in terms of our liturgical year, but it's always a good, a good thing to reflect on. So thank you very much.